Yes, this is take two of today's short lecture about modern absolutism in Central Europe. I do want you to notice, you guys are looking at the same page I am now. You see this where my cursor is? This is the study guide that I use, and it's a study guide that I'll pull up. It is now available to you uh, that will help you to keep up with what we're doing. And so, yes, and my, once again, welcome to everyone, everybody who's here in front of me, as well as you people at home. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, this is how we're going to do stuff going forward. Okay, so with that being said, let's get down to business. So what we're talking about today is modern absolutism, monarchs in Central Europe. So what is now called Germany, what we now call Germany, you know what, I'm going to get a map. <clears throat> Let's do this old school. What is now called, that's Poland, that's Germany, the yellow. What is now called Germany, nothing like high tech is there suffered from religious wars that ended in 1555 uh, and the peace agreement called in this war was called the peace of augsburg a-u-g-s-b-u-r-g 15 yeah 1555 peace of augsburg a-u-g-s-b-u-r-g had two primary provisions number one basically said that uh, I, it's called Ius Regio Curious Religio, which means that the prince of each region could decide whether or not that region would be Protestant or Catholic. Ius Regio Curious Religio. The prince chooses the religion, basically. Two, dealt with property. It said that any property that had been acquired by either Catholic or Protestant, any property had been acquired prior to 1552 would belong in those hands. I mean, there was a lot of exchanges of property, a lot of war going on, and the Roman Catholic Church had some very valuable property that was lost in this war, and whoever happened to be owning it in 1552 got to keep it. This piece was short-lived, and then was replaced by a long war called the Thirty Years' War, named the Thirty Years' War because it lasted 1618 to 1648. Thirty years. Ta-da! And uh, <clears throat> it was the bloodiest uh, of all the uh, religious wars in Western Europe. And long story short, it was primarily fought in what is now called Germany, again, and in effect, 25% of the population of Germany died in these wars um, over religion, which is, you know, when you really think about it, religious wars should be a contradiction in terms, should they not? Religion and war? Anyway, I'll kill you for Jesus. Yeah, terrible. So, Catholics and Lutherans. Each were very suspicious of each other, and both of them were wary of this third group, the Calvinists, who were becoming stronger and stronger in Germany. The Lutherans joined together in the Protestant Union, and the Catholic princes formed the Catholic League in 1609. A Protestant revolt arose in Bohemia, you say. Was Bohemia? Bohemia, and you should have a map in front of you. Find the Czech Republic, which is a smaller country that was visited by none other than yours truly in 2018. Cute country, Prague. Uh, it's, it's funny, it's a, uh, most people think of, when they think of beer in Europe, they think of Germany. The Germans go to Czech, Czech, the Czech Republic for their beer vacations. Yeah, and I mean, I remember having dinner in Prague one night, okay? And I don't drink alcohol. Never have, don't ever see that I will. But here's the thing. So we sat down to dinner one night, 
and my friends each or two friends each ordered beer and they got beer and this stein is not in this thing is not that much of an exaggeration full of beer ice cold well i ordered a ginger ale that was about 50 degrees and i wanted something to drink too and of course but of course every time I, and by the way and by the way and by the way and by the way this was cheaper than this yeah Europe's strange like that, uh, particularly the Czech Republic. I mean, you know, the Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary, a lot of people, when they think about going to Europe, they don't think about going to Eastern Europe. Those places are nice, and they're a bargain. And not only that, oh, I wouldn't know the language. Well, two things. Number one, most people in Europe speak two, if not three, languages, and one of those languages is almost always English. Uh, and two, anything, any signs that are written in Europe are always written in the country's language in big letters, but then under it, it's written in English. And it's like you're an English tourist mecca. So a revolt arose in Bohemia, and once again, what is now the Czech Republic. Uh, and the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand II sent an army into the region to put it down. What's funny is this revolt began over what is called, and you don't have to write this down, something called the defenestration of Prague, which is now the Czech Republic, the beer capital. <clears throat> and so representatives of the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand II, Catholics, and representatives of the Protestants in the Czech Republic, uh, Calvinist actually, met together in this room that was like on the third floor and floors by the way when we think of floors uh, add about like this floor here add about 15 feet well i'm not 15 but it ends up being a height of 15 feet one floor so three floors makes 45 to 50 feet i say that because in the course of this meeting discussion it got the argument got heated and the uh, protestant calvinists got so angry that they took the catholics who were in there and threw them out of the window well here's the thing they just happened to land in a ginormous pile of animal excrement you know i mean animals walked up and down the street and they had to clean the street they would and they put it into a pile use it and fertilize but it just happened to be there and of course the protestants were going ha 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 we threw you out of the third story window and the catholics were going ha 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 we said like, that should have killed them you know a fall from a 45 foot drop it should kill you and uh the catholics are ha 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 it's a miracle we didn't die but that's where it all began and so uh as it says there the protestants took this opportunity to challenge the catholic emperor this was the start of the Thirty Years' War. At first, the Habsburgs, the Catholics, won, and then they lost towards the end. During the first year, 12 years of the war, Habsburg armies from Austria and Spain crushed the Protestant forces. Ferdinand, when it says, how did Ferdinand pay his army of 125,000 men? He didn't. He told them that if you wanted pay, as you go through these Protestant lands, you just take yeah and that's not exact you know war is war but when you pillage and rape and torture people that doesn't really engender a peacemaking spirit on the other side the tide of war changed when the swedish monarch gustavus adolphus drove the catholic armies out uh, of the habsburgs out of northern germany gustavus adolphus was then killed in battle in 1632 but cardinal richelieu and Cardinal Jules Mazarin. Remember, we may we mentioned Jules Mazarin. He was the uh, regent of Louis the Fourteenth. Well, Cardinal Richelieu was the regent of his father, Louis the Thirteenth. Both are Catholic cardinals. That's worth noting. 
they sent armies, Catholic armies, into the war to fight against other Catholics. See, that is a no-no. They sent Catholics in to fight other Catholics in a war against Protestants. Yeah, that's interesting. The war was ended by the Treaty of Westphalia in 1644, but not before it had done tremendous damage to Germany. One quarter of all German farmland was destroyed. German population, as it says there, dropped from 20 million to 16 million. Germany's unification because of this does not then come about until 1873. The Peace of Westphalia had the following consequences. One, it weakened the Habsburg states of Austria and Spain. Two, France became stronger by absorbing German territory, and France actually would become the strongest country in mainland Europe. Three, it made German princes independent of the Holy Roman Empire, and it ended religious wars in Europe. It also introduced a new method of peace negotiation whereby all the participants sit down together and draw up terms, which is still used today. Okay. Strong states formed more slowly in Central Europe than in Western Europe. Who were the major powers of Central Europe during this time? Austria, Prussia, and the, during this time, uh, no, 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 um, Poland, Ottoman Empire, and the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah. It will become Russia, Prussia, and Austria. But right now, it was Poland, Austria, and the Ottoman Empire. In western parts of Europe, many peasants had won freedom, left their farms to work in cities where they made money, paid taxes, and helped strengthen the economy. But in eastern Europe, the nobility passed laws to keep peasants down on the farm. In fact, in eastern Europe, um, commoners were not so much peasants, because peasants are freemen. Peasants pay rent. But in Eastern Europe, most of the commoners were not peasants. They were serfs. S-E-R-F-A-S. Serfs don't pay rent, but at the same time, serfs, S-E-R-F, let's go surfing now, are property. Can't even make personal decisions for themselves. So, <clears throat> um, in Eastern Europe, nobility passed laws to keep the peasants down on the farm to make big harvests which they could sell and make a nice profit, but that did little for the economy of the nations overall. In Poland, the king had little real power as he had no taxes with which to raise an army and re wield real power. The Ottoman Empire had advanced to the gates of Vienna twice, but after that, after they get thrown back for the second time, and by the way, the Polish king, King John Sobieski, was the one who actually help the Austrians throw out the Ottomans. After that, the Ottoman Empire will go into a period of decline, weaker and weaker and weaker until it dissolves in World War I. The Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire and could not even unite its people. Two regions of this empire will gradually develop, the Habsburgs of Austria and the Hohenzollerns from Prussia. Those these are the two names of the two ruling families of the Austrians and the Prussians. The Habsburgs you know, of Austria did three things to consolidate their foothold in the empire. They reconquered Bohemia, Czech Republic. Bohemians are Czech. They speak Bohemian. Uh, they're Slavic peoples, centralized the government of Austria and raised a standing army, and retook Hungary from the Ottomans and made Hungary a part of the Austrian Empire until, once again, the aforementioned World War I, 1918. Charles VI became the ruler of Austria, an empire that had many diverse ethnicities and nationalities. He wore the Austrian, Hungarian, and Bohemian crowns of his empire. But Charles VI had a problem. He had no sons. He did have a daughter named Maria Theresa. Problem was, he was afraid that no one would respect her right to rule Austria because she was a female. 
just like in the case of the War of Spanish Succession, the same thing is going to happen. And so Charles VI says, hmm, I know what to do. So Charles VI goes around to all of his king buddies, the other kings, crown heads of Europe, and he says, you know what, when I die, will you respect the right of my daughter, Maria Theresa, to rule Austria? And they all said, well, sure, we're buddies. Uh, we'll do that. And by the way, this document was called the Pragmatic Sanction, a guarantee that they would respect Maria Theresa's right to do that. Um, his primary concern, of course, was his ri German rivals from Prussia. By the way, by the way, let me write this down here. All Austrians are German. All Prussians are German. But not all Germans are either Prussian or Austrian. Like a set subset thing. So Austria and Prussia are going to compete for the leadership of the German people. You do know, of course, that today in Europe, more people wake up speaking German than any other language group. Yeah, German, the Germans are the largest ethnicity in all of Europe. The Hohenzollerns of Prussia wanted to increase their authority in Central Europe at the expense of all others. The Hohenzollerns, that's the ruling family of, of Prussia. Frederick William felt that having a large standing army was the best way to ensure security. He built this army to a standing army of about 80,000 men, which was the best and most well-trained in Europe. It was once said, it was once said about Prussia, that Prussia, which will become Germany eventually, but Prussia was a army with a country not a country, an army, an army with a country. He paid for it with permanent taxation. He also negotiated with the landowning class, the, and this is pronounced, Junkers. Not Junkers, Junkers. The Junkers were the landowning nobility of Prussia. And going forward, going forward, these Prussians will dominate the ranks of the officer corps in the Prussian, later German, military. It's one of the reasons why Adolf Hitler never got along with his general staff. Why? Because Adolf Hitler, if you recall, was not German, technically. He was Austrian. And these Junkers, the officers in the German high command, were all not only German, they were Prussian, they were Junkers. That means that they were all lifelong officers. Their fathers have been lifelong officers. Their grandfathers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, going back to the Middle Ages. And so, yeah. Frederick William felt that his son Frederick might not be king or ruler of material because Frederick was different. Uh, he loved the arts, not the military, even though that is what he's best known for. He becomes known as Frederick the Great. He ran away as a child, and his father made him when his father made him witness the beheading of one of his friends. You know, <laughs> what you find is that the crown heads of Europe, they didn't get the parenting thing. You know what I'm saying? He became known as Frederick the Great, who was a great patron of the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason. He softened some of his father's laws, encouraged religious toleration, uh, introduced the potato to, to Prussia. Yeah. And you say, what's the big deal about the potato? Well, the potato was and is a marvelous crop. Uh, the potato can provide about 10 times more calories per acre than can wheat. And the potato grew really well in the damp, acidic soils of northern Europe, northern and eastern Europe. Frederick the Great initiated the War of Austria in succession, which was another example of the balance of power in action. To initiate it, remember, Charles VI had died, Maria Theresa is the queen, 
of Austria. And Charles and Frederick the Great says, you know what? I never liked my dad anyway. So I didn't sign the pragmatic sanctions. So I'm going to do what I want to. So he seized the Austrian province of Silesia. Why did he want that province? Because it, he was trying to, if you look at a map, you look at a map of uh, Prussia. It's a country that's geographically separated. And he was trying to unite the entire country geographically. France joined the Prussians because France smelled blood and thought they could rip off a piece of Austrian territory. And then Britain joined with Austria. And here we go. Britain joined with Austria, not because the British cared about Maria Theresa, not because the British, you know, care, cared about the pragmatic sanction. The Britons, British joined with Austria to oppose France because the, the um, French threatened to become too powerful. Who won? Well, two nations won the War of Austria in succession. One was England because... When the war was over, France went back to their hole and had gained nothing. And also Prussia. Prussia because Prussia got into the war to, to uh, gain Silesia and they got to keep it. See, look, who won this war? Prussia got Silesia. Everyone else got nothing. So who won? Two countries once again. Prussia because they got what they wanted. And Britain because, you know, they had kept France from getting any more power. What was the diplomatic revolution? Well, the diplomatic revolution happened shortly after the War of Austrian Succession, just like that basketball game I talked about, where at one point in time the score was 100 to 2. What do you do? You change sides. And that is what is called the diplomatic revolution. France and Austria joined together, and Russia versus England and Prussia. In 1756, Prussia attacked Saxony as an Austrian ally, and this became known as the Seven Years' War. This war spread around the world, was pretty much left Europe, and was waged primarily in North America as the French and Indian War. And boys and girls, that's where I'm going to stop today. Two things. Number one, you saw the saw this the guided notes I put for you there. Notice that yesterday there was those terms. So if we have time in the end of class, that's what you'll do. And we'll continue and talk about Peter the Great next. And end.